Welcome to Building Tomorrow, a show dedicated to the ways that tech and innovation are making us happier, healthier, and more prosperous. Uh, with me today is uh, Matthew Feeney, uh, Director of Emerging Technology here at Cato. As usual, I'm your host, Paul Matsko, and joining us is special guest Brent Scorup, the Senior Research Fellow for kind of all things tech at Mercatus. Welcome to the show, Brent. Thanks for having me. Uh, so today we're going to discuss um, uh, your plan for new drone, a new kind of drone and um, light aircraft. And uh, so, but I think before we get into the details of what your plan calls for in terms of regulation, let's lay a little bit out about where are we at with um, light aircraft, the drone airspace use, like where is this tech pushing us as consumers in America? There's, because of various technology advancements over the last few years, what what most people would call flying car technology, I, I try to avoid that term because okay. people roll their eyes and, and there's stigma. But uh, but when it, when you're like in, in newspapers, you, you have to say this so people kind of understand what it is. But flying car technology, yeah. air taxi technology, it, it goes by various names, vertical takeoff and landing, VTOL. So all, all these are, are somewhat interchangeable. And, and because of various uh, technology advancements, as, as I mentioned, things like battery improvements, mm -hmm. uh, ride sharing software, autonomy improvements in the last 10 years. Many companies around the world are, are st and governments are starting to think of air taxi service as a viable commercial service. And, and uh, but there is, no one's quite sure how, how this regulation will work out. And I, I saw room for, um, for a paper on the subject and about air traffic management and and these so-called passenger drones uh, and VTOL aircraft. So w w whether we call it vertical takeoff and landing or flying car or, or air taxi tech, um, where are we seeing this being implemented? Right, like like my understanding is here in the U.S., it's all there's the promise of it taking place, but we're actually seeing experimentation elsewhere in the world. It seems like most of this is going on uh, in in other countries. New Zealand pops up frequently. The, the government is, is is fairly accommodating to to companies in in New Zealand. Uh, I think it's Sergey Brin of, of Google has a company called Kitty Hawk uh, that, that's doing a lot in this in New Zealand. Uh, China is is a major player, and and they seem to be doing a lot of work in. In China, but also uh, Dubai, there, there have been some test flights of autonomous VTOL, autonomous air taxis. Um, the European, regula uh, European regulators recently, uh, a few weeks ago, put out uh, proposed regulations. They're, I mean, they're starting to think um, about this commercial service. And, and the U.S. seems to be lagging a little bit. The, the, the U.S., I mean, I should say, has a has a very commendable safety record, uh, but that also means they're they're very cautious uh, about this. So maybe give us a sense of the actual capabilities of the technology as it is. Are we talking about a technology uh, that is really in development or something that's being kept grounded? So you know, if today there were no regulatory barriers, could you and I get in one of these on the roof at Cato and fly to Dulles Airport or would we crash on the White House lawn? Uh, how far would we be, get going? <laughs> We, we, we could fly today in one of these battery okay. powered and, and should say that there are uh, what's called eVTOL, electric VTOL, which are, are battery powered, of course. And, and the range seems pretty substantial, 50 miles perhaps, uh, and they, they can carry multiple people. Um, and, and should say the capacity for these, typically one to six passengers, uh, six is about the highest I've seen. And that's eVTOL. There's, there's another related technology, hybrid VTOL, which is battery fuel hybrid. And those can do several hundred miles mm -hmm. and and similar to commercial aviation. And 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 these these have, have different issues. I I think the, the E VTOL is is more exciting because that's a, an entirely new market, just interest city, getting across city, getting to the airport. And and getting to the airport is what what folks think will be um, Kind of the immediate market, because going from downtown areas out to uh, the outskirts where the airports are, and and you just have uh, you know business customers. So all that to say, yeah, this you, you could hop into one of these today. I'm not 
I'm not sure I would do it today. It is, this is, there's only been a, a, a few flights that that I'm aware of, but but yeah, you could do this today. Who wants to be the guinea pig for, yeah, so, someone will. Yes. Um, <laughs> Some brave soul. But you can imagine the attraction, which is, you know, we live in a congested uh, city in, here in DC, or if you live in New York or any kind of uh, urban center where if you can do uh, just a hop, uh, you know, a 15 mile hop from the suburb into the center city, might take you 20, 25 minutes in one of these, you know, uh, air taxis, but that's an hour, two hours in bad traffic into the city. That's a significant savings in time if you can just go, you know, kind of as the crow flies. Um, the, uh, but like as you're describing this, I'm just thinking, well, that's a that's a helicopter. So how how does this differ from a helicopter? Is it just a helicopter? What, what are we? You know, so as we think about this, why is this such a big deal since we already have things that that vertically take off, move, and land somewhere else? So some some of the benefits relative to helicopters, one one is noise. It's expected these will be not quiet, but significantly quieter than helicopters. And, and in urban areas, particularly in the U.S., uh, one reason we don't have many helipads and, and helicopter infrastructure is is because of the noise. Inevitable complaints and, and the and the disruption. I, I live in Arlington, Virginia. It seems there's there's frequent helicopters. It's pretty pretty uh, disruptive. So so noise is, noise is one benefit. Uh, lesser noise. The other is is that helicopters. Uh, the 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 single rotor means um, if something does go wrong, it, it it goes seriously wrong. And so with with uh, multi rotor. VTOLs, which might have between four, 16, maybe 32 rotors, uh, if, if, and they can all be independently uh, controlled. If, if there is a problem, uh, these can still, still stay in the air and still land safely. Um, maintenance on helicopters, similar, just, just there, there's a, particularly with, with the engines, there's a lot of maintenance and it's a, it's a huge ongoing cost for helicopters is, is maintenance. And it's expected with these electric motors, uh, the maintenance will be much less. So when we're uh, uh, discussing this issue in particular, I, I suppose it would be worth you know plugging the actual paper. So uh, anyone listening can can go to uh, the, the Makeda Center's website and take a look at uh, auctioning airspace. And uh, the title is, I guess, sort of uh, revealing the conclusion, right? But uh, – why uh, why are you taking the approach of, of auctioning airspace? Uh, people might listening uh, who don't follow aviation policy might be thinking, well, who owns the air now? Uh, and how would this change things for, for me, just a, a homeowner on the ground? Yeah, so the, this paper comes from uh, – I've done a lot of telecom history, mm. uh, a lot of telecom history and policy. And as I was learning more about this technology – I thought there, there's a lot of analogs with with spectrum policy in particular, and in this paper, I I, I look at analogs of, of federal property that is um, owned nominally by the people. It's managed by federal governments, and and we have we have many examples of the federal government auctioning uh, federal assets off for commercial use, and spectrum is a big one. The FCC has done spectrum auctions for 20 years now. Uh, gained a lot of revenue. Companies have uh, a semblance of property rights to to make the investments needed in, in these capital intensive industries. Uh, offshore oil leases in the Gulf of Mexico, in particular, this is federal property. It's it's auctioned off on a geographic basis, like Spectrum, and and, and companies again have have the investment incentives necessary to to build and and, and to operate uh, oil extraction. Uh, a newer a newer uh, example of this is offshore wind energy, offshore wind uh, windmill sites. These are auctioned by the federal government as well. So we we have all these examples, and I, I think there's, and I think airspace resembles these uh, much more than say a, a roadway, which is kind of a traditional open access. Uh, you know, it's just an ancient tradition that roadways and rivers are, are open access and open to the public, and and I, I think that's the wrong model. I, I think I think an exclusive use model works better. Um, and and the difference of airspace and, and airspace is has been it's owned by the American public. It's owned by you, you and me, but it's it's managed by the federal government exclusively, all, all navigable airspace. 
Um, and so, and so anyway, th this proposal, I, I think this looks much more like spectrum or offshore wind energy where, where you hit, where you need large investments and unlike roads and rivers, there is, there is no history of, of mass use of this. And, you know, one, and, and people might say, well, why don't, why don't we auction roads or, or rivers off? And I think one answer is that there, we, we don't have millennia of practice of, of humans actually accessing this. It would be hugely disruptive and... And the other thing is our roadways, we have 30, 40,000 deaths a year on roadways. And part of that is because it's open access. No one would tolerate that in airspace. You, 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 need, you need much safer uh, airspace. And so for all these reasons, I, I think an exclusive use model, and, and I, I made clear in the paper, I'm, I'm not saying air taxi companies should have fee simple, uh, complete private property to this uh, for various reasons. I, I don't think that's the right model. I think much like Spectrum, these are conditional multi-year uh, licenses with many attrib attributes of, of property rights, but not not fee simple. Well, let's dig into some of those bits here in a second. Um, you know, we'll talk about fee simple property and the auctions in a little more detail. Um, but I, I think some of our listeners are going to wonder, well, why do we need to change anything? And to understand that question, they need to know how does it currently work? Like if you want, if you're part of a startup that's creating a next gen VTOL, um, what does low altitude airspace look like for you? Who gets to use it? Um, how is it defined? I know there's different like classes of airspace. There's restrictions on how the airspace is used. So dig into that a little bit for our listeners. How, how is that, that airspace currently used? Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's important to back up and say what what my paper covers. So my paper, and 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 I kind of draw these lines arbitrarily, but there is some thought behind them. Is airspace above two hundred feet altitude, all the way up to five thousand feet altitude, and so that's, that's below where planes fly. Yeah, yeah. Or, so or in planes, planes, I think thirty thousand feet, thirty five thousand feet altitude. So th this is fairly clean. Federal resource. Uh, there, there's not many users. There, there are some helicopters, hang gliders, uh, some general, you know, small aircraft. Um, but this is a fairly clean federal asset. So, I I want to make clear in the paper, it's it's not talking about drone airspace. I think there are entirely different issues with very low altitude, below 200 feet. You have property rights issues and, and other things. Um, so, so it's 200 feet all the way up to 5,000 feet, and this is where people expect. V tolls and air taxis will okay. will will occur, um, and so right now that low that relatively low altitude space is just kind of a a, a free for all. Uh, anyone can use it as I mean. So if you're a hang glider operator, you don't have to go get permission from the FAA to fly your hang glider in in that space, right? Or I mean, helicopters are though regulated by the FAA flying within that space. So how right. how does that like why couldn't VTOL operators why do they need to do what you're proposing why can't they just keep operating like helicopters or hang gliders or small aircraft that fly in that current space? Well, right now a a big a big obstacle is is the federal government hasn't quite figured out how to classify these and and there's various ways you know are, are these you know, fixed wing aircraft are these uh, like helicopters. So they need a regulatory system, a regulatory classification, and and and, and the FAA does tremendous amounts of of pre-approval certification of, of airworthiness. And so, right now, the, these have not um, have not been classified by the federal government, and and therefore can't fly. There there is a, a waiver process, but that's not that's ad hoc, and you can't really develop an industry that way. So you could do it, but not. You're in a legal gray area, and I mean that's trouble. Right, that's... and 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 you know it should be said the no none of these companies are 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 looking to uh, move fast and break things as 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 you might in in uh, you know with with software and internet based thing. I mean, so th these companies they they want this industry to be safe. They want to cooperate with the federal government, and and the, and to the, to NASA and FAA's credit, they they have been fairly accommodating. They want to see this develop, and and uh, they're working closely with companies about how to how to make this uh, safe, mm -hmm. primarily, but but also um, efficient in in a, in a commercial market. 
So when people say, uh, or when you say more accurately, a, a auction of airspace, are you talking about auctioning layers of airspace? So someone could auction a uh, 1,000 feet to 1,100? Uh, or are you talking about auctioning, for lack of a better analogy, roads in the sky, certain specific geographic lanes? Uh, or is it a mixture of both? A mixture, a mixture. So, and it, it's hard to say, it's hard to say, Kind of at the outset, what what the best model is, you you gain flexibility if you've kind of auctioned off, you know, cubes of airspace. Uh, you know, I, I say in the paper maybe about neighborhood sized and a few hundred meters tall. Um, on, on the plus side, there's a bunch of modularity. Companies can if if they if they acquire a bunch of these, they can change uh, routes as, as time goes on. They can they can. Put these these vertiports, basically huge helipads at, at various parts in the city, as as demands change, as as new new customers come online. I think uh, the fixed route auctions. I, I suspect. Um, well, so it should be said, companies are already expecting there will be fixed routes for safety reasons. What what they envision though is is much like uh, traditional aviation, where these routes are shared by. Uh, competitors like commercial aviation, they share terminals, they share routes, and in my paper is trying to avoid the sharing of, of routes and terminals. I, I think I think all, all sorts of you create all sorts of problems, and, and many of the things we we hate about traditional aviation, I think, arises from the fact that competitors have to share terminals and and routes. What about the? Uh, issue that will inevitably arise. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, Arlington, Virginia, where, where I live too. Uh, I can imagine a lot of my neighbors not being particularly happy if suddenly there were uh, dozens of these things buzzing overhead, even if they were at 1,000 feet or 1,100. Uh, do you uh, envision some kind of mechanism for firms to deal with the privacy and noise pollution complaints that people will inevitably have? I think the noise issue is is possibly the biggest or one of the biggest obstacles. Aside from yeah, I think the technology is is advancing fairly predictably, and will be there soon if it's not already there. The regulatory system, it'll eventually happen. I mean, what what scale will these be commercial? Eventually, these will be permitted. The 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 noise, the public acceptance, I, I think could could trip trip this industry up and I, I think a lot of it is education and and uh, particularly with officials at the local level um, but uh, yeah in traditional aviation Mercatus put out a paper a few years ago I can't remember the exact numbers but you, you see a power law of, of noise complaints basically in, in DC for instance I, I think there's a handful of people maybe five people who make up a massive amount of, of the noise complaints and and uh, I think data analytics just showing that there is this power law. It's you know it's it's a few people who who for whatever reason are sensitive to to these noises. So I think there needs to be research about you know how loud are these. Um, and there, there's studies going on if you follow this industry about like noise profiles and ways of uh, you know what people can handle and kind of baseline uh, noise. I, I think it's a fruitful area. I hope I hope. Um, I hope the companies and, and and the federal government will continue to study this and 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 you know maybe someday there'll be kind of a safe harbor if if you're below this decibel level at this height then then you're presumptively approved but yeah the the noise is is a serious serious concern so I mean which puts me in mind of of something else which is that one of the early complaints about the beginning of vehicular transportation on the roads on the cars. Was that they were loud? Cars are louder than I mean. I guess you got the clop clop of a horse's hooves, but especially those early pre-muffler engines, you know, vehicular traffic was really loud too, and people were concerned about the externality created by loud cars going through residential neighborhoods. Um, and we found the way to solve that. Um, you know, and and it was a long conversation. To some extent, people just got used to it. I mean, we have cars go outside of our houses. Uh, and there are, in a, in a sense, we price that noise into the price of our houses. So houses right along highways are usually cheaper than houses that are in little cul-de-sacs, right? Like we, 
we recognize that it creates an externality. We manage it through education. We manage it through uh, different regulatory means. But um, it wasn't something that had, you know, it, we were able to overcome that barrier. This brings me to mind, though, something, uh, Matthew, you mentioned before the show, which was, I mean, so for thinking about roads, road lines, um, as a way of directing traffic and among other reasons to keep the noise and kind of defined corridors, um, flesh that out. How, how might that like apply to airspace? Oh, well, I, I've been working on uh, drone issues for a while, mostly in the law enforcement context, right? But of course, we're, we're having to consider uh, commercial use of drones and everyone's very excited about delivery drones and, and talking to people in the building. Yeah, I haven't published anything on this, but there, there is a uh, an ongoing debate about, well, what would a rule look like if we just said, you can fly drones, they just have to go above current public space. So as long as you stick to the roads and you're flying above them, uh, then you're fine. Just uh, as a way to avoid the inevitable problems of uh, people complaining about privacy issues, uh, people shooting them down with shotguns, uh, <laughs> all these uh, problems that you can imagine uh, having. Although, but I think these this technology raises different kinds of issues. I think people are going to be less likely to take a shotgun to something that there are human beings inside of, and yeah, one hopes. And uh, there's uh, obviously. Probably in virtue of the fact that they'll be bigger, less um, uh, less chance of them actually flying above a lot of roads, uh, depending on the altitude, right? Uh, but this is, um, of course, a, a difficult conversation because of uh, current regulation, which is why I think we need proposals that, like like Brent's, that are they're talking about. Well, how can we think about airspace differently? Uh, and this uh, the, the the road analogy, I, I agree with you. I think there are, there are serious. Um, issues with that. But but something that did occur to me when um, looking over some of the material is how, how do we stop uh, a, in a, a monopoly uh, emerging here? What, what's to stop if we had an auction system uh, and, the, and it's a tracks uh, system where the, you have these um, air lanes, uh, how do we ensure that uh, a, a little startup is able to actually get in the air if, if uh, Google, for example, or some other big company has come in and bought all of the uh, the the air lanes. So I, I think we can learn some lessons from from spectrum policy and and again uh, offshore oil leasing. So typically to prevent the mon monopolization problem, there there is a, a cap to what one company can control in in a market. And you know I I don't I haven't looked at this too closely, but I mean intuitively that seems to make sense for me. If if, if the government is auctioning this off, they shouldn't they should avoid. Uh, auction off monopolies, and so you could imagine some kind of uh, cap on, on on what you could control. The other thing is is just what, what's the size of 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 the air tract that, that you're auctioning off, and 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 just how those auctions are carried out. You you can prevent monopolization problems. I, I say in the paper, for instance, you know, one auction off one tract. In Washington D.C., would would clearly create a monopoly problem. Mm. Um, on the other side, you, you don't want to auction off, you know, a, a cubic foot uh, everywhere. That that would be an excessive, uh, you know, everyone you could, everyone could afford a piece, but you would have a, a fragmentation problem. Um, and in the paper, I, I say, you know, it, again, it, it's hard to say at the outset what what the optimal what the what the optimal uh, competitive size is, but I would I would say somewhere around neighborhood size, so that you could have multiple providers per city, um, and but but again, and, and and what what the government does with with other auctions is, is they consult with industry about you know what 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 size is practical and and uh, and they also need to ensure that there is competition. And just a second to for our listeners, you know, so think about this in 3D, right? So you're you're not getting all the air in that whole range, right? It's layers. Um, it, do you have a, an estimate of how thick those layers should be? So between 200 and 5,000 feet, how many layers are we talking about? Are they 100 foot wide or tall, I suppose I should say? Yeah, I, I haven't even haven't even gotten that detailed yet. I mean, I, I would expect a few hundred meters um, tall just just to give you know plenty of buffer and, and allowance, um, but but, but we're uh, talking about potentially dozens of layers in yeah, that space. Yeah, and, and also, you know, the, also 
you know, if, if they are on a kind of cubic basis, not, not on a route basis, um, that, that opens up because it's just 3D. Mm-hmm. Even if a company, you know, let, let's say, you know, if, if you're in DC, um, a company has a foggy bottom for a deport station and they're flying to Dulles. And, and another company has, has a Capitol Hill station, foggy bottom, you know, it, you know, gets in the way on the way to Dulles. But with 3D, you could, you know, acquire parcels that would go around and, and still get out to Dulles. So, yeah, the 3D nature of this opens up uh, more competitive options. Mm-hmm. You know, it might not be a perfectly direct route, but uh, but you could. It improves the competitive potential for for this market. One imagines that innovators in this space would want to have entry as frictionless as possible, right? So that they, it seems unlikely that a firm would say, "Yeah, well, we're just going to fly these three hundred feet over people's homes, and uh, well, we'll deal with issues as they arise." Uh, Presumably, they are aware that there will be growing pains and concerns and uh, will take steps. But that's just a guess. Who knows what yeah. will end up happening? Yeah. Uh, Never underestimate the abil- the uh, willingness of, uh, you know, of an uncaring mm-hmm. <laughs> corporation to, you know, be like, yeah, it's we'll their figure problem. figure it out. Oh, we'll figure it out, yeah. Have you... Uh, just, this made me think of something that, that we're in on notes. Have... Uh, have have there been any uh, preemptive discussions about the potential environmental impact on these? Are these going to kill a lot of birds? Are they going to freak out animals? Is, is there any kind of discussion about that yet? I haven't seen anything about that. Okay. No. I guess that's a, a when, not an if question, right? <laughs> I mean, and functionally, I mean, that seems like a it's a non-unique problem to your plan, right? I mean, you put more stuff up in the sky, it's going to run into more birds. It's just the nature of it. Um, no matter how you end up managing the airspace, it's just a, a question of filling that volume with more objects. But I suppose the the reason I'm asking about birds specifically is not just the potential environmental impact, but a few birds can bring down a, a commercial airliner, right? And uh, I don't know what the safety issues are with this technology in particular. Brent might uh, obviously knows more than both of us, but uh, if a bird flew into one of these things or got sucked in above my house and it fell on my house, that's a something people would worry about. Yeah, uh, I, I haven't I haven't looked at this issue too closely. Mm-hmm. Um, you, I, I do think the the multi rotor, you know, independent rotors mm-hmm. is, is a big right. safety benefit. Whereas you know, a, a, a twin jet engine, f- one or, or Two goes down, it, it's pretty catastrophic. Um, but yeah, I haven't looked into it too, too, too closely. I do think it's interesting. So um, I know uh, folks, I, I mean, this is not an original thought to me. In fact, I think uh, I've heard it brought up at some of our um, some of our gatherings before, which is, you know, th- this tech can be kind of geotagged, right? So uh, and this is, I'm talking here more about drones, but I think this can also be applied to, to air taxis or the VTOLs. Um, which is that you can tell the drone not to go within so many yards of a military base, uh, of other sensitive or airports, other sensitive locations. Now that can be hacked. There are concerns about exactly how effective that is. But for 99% of ordinary users, it's pretty effective at keeping drones or potentially effective at keeping drones away from sensitive places. So in theory, you can program those drones to stick to their stick to their lanes. I, I mean, I think that's quite interesting. Or if you only auction off the airspace over roads, over you know already public land, um, you can make sure they stick to their lanes, which helps mitigate um, some of the problem you're describing, which is that if a bird does hit one of these things, well, it's flying over, well, like flying over a highway, and, and the thing comes down. Not much that much better, but it's not coming down in the house then. Um, so the externality is a little bit different. Um, I mean, at some point, one of these things is going to come down. At some point, if it lands on a you know a car, well, cars have accidents. I mean, it's going to generate some externality just because things moving run into other things eventually, and injury and death and torts are generated by that. But there's a way of, of making sure that it falls in areas where we currently expect death, injury, and torts to take place, which is on highways or, you know. Yeah, no, right. you could you could take that approach right. for sure. Yeah, I, I'll just say on, on, on that topic, uh, this, this geofencing is going on today with commercial drones. And, and I know uh, DJI, which I believe is the biggest drone 
manufacturer in in the world. I th I think every drone now they they have this geofencing capability, mm -hmm. and and the the FAA even has uh, the beginnings of a real time geofenced uh, system where a drone operator can can uh, get get real time permission from from air traffic control and and the FAA to fly. Um, it's it's fairly rudimentary, but I mean you see the possibilities and and, and the idea of geofencing areas off. In, in talking with drone operate, the, the altitude is a little trickier. Just mm -hmm. um, but but the geofencing, yeah, that's um, fairly well understood. Do you see these competing with logistics or delivery companies? So we've been using the the word taxi. So the idea, I suppose, being that these kind of devices will be competing with Uber or traditional taxis. Uh, do in your research, after doing research, do you think it's actually feasible that they could be used for short haul Amazon deliveries or, or things like that? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I expect drone deliveries will be, okay. will cover most of this. And, you know, in thinking about this, you know, it, it would have to be, you know, fairly heavy that you would need a, a larger, larger than a drone. Um, yeah, I expect there there would be some, particularly maybe maybe with like large medical shipments. And and I met at a at a the Uber Elevate conference, which is kind of devoted to this air taxi industry. A few months ago, I I, I heard of an entrepreneur entrepreneur who who wanted to do this uh, for I believe it was pig heart valves and just the immediacy. Okay. I mean, just kind of organ donations. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, there, there's all kinds of ide ideas out there. I, I don't know. Um, you know, if if human organs uh, if or, or, or animal yeah. organ, and that sort of thing. But um, I think in medicine, particularly, I mean, this is just drone delivery, uh, particularly in in Rwanda. I saw I saw recently Rwanda thirty thirty five percent of blood uh, to hospitals, uh, blood donation to hospitals delivered via drone in Rwanda. And, and there's a company called Zipline that does this and. Yeah, medicine. Medicine seems with drone delivery seems like a, a, a useful application for this. Mm -hmm. uh, so, a few other concerns that I think um, folks, particularly our listeners, who tend to skew a little more uh, libertarian, a little more skeptical of of government re regulation in general. Um, I think one of the things that's going to pop up in some of our listeners' minds is, well, why should we have a one size fits all? FCC, federal government agency policy. Uh, why it, are there federalism concerns here? Why shouldn't shouldn't this be left to the lab, you know the experimental laboratories of the states or of municipalities to determine how they want to regulate drone airspace in their town or in their state? So you your whole model is predicated on a, fe, a federal model, the FC, uh, the FAA. Sorry, um, auctioning off. Airspace. Why is that? Like, so what's your what's your answer to people who are concerned about federalism issues? Yeah, th there are uh, important federalism issues, and in short, my paper tries to avoid all that. And and, and the airspace I'm talking about, 200 feet and above. Um, I don't know where that that line will be drawn. I, I expect the federal government will need to draw a line at some point and say what what is uh, what is covered by the jurisdiction of the state and and what what is federal. Um, right now, all navigable airspace is federal. And according to the FAA's current interpretation, that means um, two inches off the ground outside is 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 navigable airspace. Mm -hmm. um, the model, I think, will eventually see is much, again, like offshore oil, where in the 1950s, I think it was the Submerged Lands Act, the federal government said three miles out, uh, is controlled by the state, and the, and the state uh, controls how, how that property is managed. But beyond three miles, generally, is, is federal property. I, I think because of these new, I mean, so we haven't had this issue before of multiple parties at different layers in the airspace. Um, my next paper, I think, will we'll talk more about these federalism okay. issues, and that deals with below 200 feet. Above 200 feet, though, it's 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 my belief and assumption that this should remain federally controlled. So in a sense, though, this paper is kind of agnostic to the question of who should be controlling the air or which regulator should have oversight. It's just this is the way it's currently done. And but I mean, in theory, you, the real model is the auction model, not which regulator gets to, in a yeah. sense, run the auctions. I mean, it's just 
you're dealing with the lay of the land here. Um, one more question that came to mind on kind of the same theme. Um, so you're going to have folks who look at this. And, and for those of us, I also come from kind of a telecom history background. Uh, we had the same, you've referred a couple of times to uh, spectrum auctions. So like radio, television, wireless spectrum. Um, back in the 1920s, they, there was a, a debate over how should the, essentially it was the same kind of debate. We have this new technology that's allowing us to access electromagnetic waves and turn them into you know, commercially and uh, uh, useful uh, endeavors, uh, radio at the time. Who gets to regulate it? How do we determine who gets a hold of it? And there were a couple of models that were proposed, one of which was a kind of a British style, a national monopoly. The BBC, the British Bro Broadcasting Channel, would um, would just run it themselves. It was a national monopoly. So that'd be like the FAA. We keep this airspace, we control it. In fact, everything that flies in it, we essentially get to determine where it goes. We might even own it ourselves, a very command and control model. Uh, then there was a, well, well, we'll kind of issue licenses, a license model, which we did here in the United States. You get a radio station license to operate on a particular wavelength. Uh, later on, a kind of libertarian leaning economist uh, proposed an auction system, Co Co's, 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 Co's. Yeah. Um, proposed an, an auction system, kind of like what you're proposing. But I think there's folks who are going to say, well, why why should we do this auction system? Why can't we just do command and control? Why can't we like so? What are the problems with these other models of running like of of running what we do with VTOLs? So the the auction system for Spectrum has, I mean, you know, part of the model for this is, is, is Spectrum auctions. I mean, so in in the allocation via via auction on exclusive basis for multi-year periods uh, ser serves a few benefits. One is the government is basically auctioning off a, a commodity. You know, it, it can be it can be used for anything. So Spectrum, you know, could be used for broadcast TV, it could be used for cellular, it could be used for um, you know, satellite, um, all these things. And with auction, the government is is auctioning off a commodity that's flexible use. Companies can use it in in whatever manner they 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 wish, and and this has this has helped make the U.S. a, a, a leader in, in wireless technologies. Companies can change their technologies without government permission. Unlike in the that, that started in the, in the, the 90s, 1980s, 80s, yeah, the auctions in the 90s, but the flexible use, uh, okay. yeah. So I mean, this has all been fairly recent, and mm -hmm. you know, as you're familiar. The FCC used to be the they would dictate what the service had to be, where it could be, mm -hmm. and they would give away for free on a, on a, uh, based on some some imaginary public interest uh, evaluation, which was bad for innovation. I mean, right, uh, terrible, terrible for innovation, um, and it, it basically politically connected mm -hmm. got mm -hmm. got access to this federal asset, and and that's been much improved. You know, it's night and day. Once auctions started, mm -hmm. companies could make make their investments. They could transfer something valuable to an income to a new newcomer, mm -hmm. if if they designed a better mousetrap. And you didn't have that in the past. So the same thing with with airspace here potentially, which is that we we want to avoid underutilization of the airspace because folks, you know, like we we don't want to stymie the innovation that's going on, the competition between these operators. Yeah, so what what I fear with low altitude airspace that that we're talking about with with VTOL and air taxis is that if this technology does succeed and there is commercial demand, how do you how do you allocate it? And and my fear is they all allocate it for free to whoever is in the market at the time. And and this is basically what happened with traditional aviation where once the jet age came, uh, you you had tremendous congestion problems. You had you, for the first time you had to figure out how do we how do we allocate this this uh, federal asset. And I, in in the paper I, I point to in New York City in, in, in the late 1960s, much of U.S. aviation delays were based in New York City in the three airports. There, the the uh, air traffic control they. They raised landing fees, $20 in 1968, on all small aircraft. 
small called general aviation. General aviation traffic plummeted 30% with that $20 fee and delays fell over 50%. That's that's a remarkable change with with a very small fee, $20 per landing. And that's because I mean so that just suggests there was tremendous amounts of low value flights going on mm-hmm. and it, because it was unpriced and, and clogging up the airspace right, for and, other more efficient uses. And yeah. and so that's why I'm worried, particularly in a fast moving sector like VTOL, where there will be, we know there will be advancements mm-hmm. and, and companies will design better systems. If it's allocated by, by agencies or in cooperation with the incumbents who are already in the marketplace, which is what happened in traditional aviation, you, you, you harm the innovations, you harm the innovators who want to enter the market. The incumbents have nothing to transfer because they're sharing this resource with regulators, with competitors. And so that's why I want to avoid. I, I, want, I want companies to have something to transfer if someone better comes, comes along. And so you need ex- exclusivity for that. And, and uh, on the congestion, how, how, do you, how do you allocate in, in times of congestion? A few months ago, the NASA put out a report on, on this very topic. NASA and the FAA are, are doing um, regulation of, of this sector. And, and they, they say our, our, our plans right now, which is basically a centralized allocation mechanism, which might be some kind of public-private allocation of airspace, say that this will work for modest amounts of traffic, mm. which raises the question, what, what, what if there's <laughs> yeah, not right. modest amounts? And, yeah, and, and yeah. the answer, they say, well, right – we as regulators will, will step in and allocate it um, uh, on as needed basis, and, and so that's that's not. I see all all kinds of problems with with regulators doing that, and it gets back again to, to spectrum, where basically a politically powerful and the incumbents, I, I think, will will control it, and and I, I think I think that would be especially damaging in this sector again, as I said, where this is moving very rapidly, and and we don't want to bias the regulatory system towards. Yeah. Uh, today's today's companies. There's kind of a, a perverse unintended consequence, which is that in theory, um, I mean, this happened for for radio, which is that there were always concerns that dominant players in the in the marketplace, the big networks, would gain essentially monopoly control, and therefore uh, there was pressure on the FCC to implement regulations to make sure that wouldn't take place, to take a heavier hand, a, a, a more involved hand, but that actually played into the interests of the major, mar- of the incumbents, because they were better able to well, lobby the regulators to tweak those rules in ways that favored them, to, you know, so there was a lot more kind of corruption, regulatory capture. They also better able to just comply. They're, they're big. They have lots of capital investment they can you know they can comply they can make better more convincing bids for the licenses so you end up with this whole system meant to um in a sense diminish incumbent control that actually ends up increasing incumbent control um whereas if you auction it off well the the folks who own that property right i mean there, there's a kind of a natural competitive element baked into the system uh, you, you can't buy off the regulator to tweak the rules because someone else owns that that chunk of airspace. So I, I, I find that quite interesting. Um, so uh, Brent, uh, one last question here. Um, so again, some of our, our listeners are going to hear this and say, okay, uh, so I get why we don't want this to be like traditional aviation. We want to avoid the problems that came with uh, the congestion that came with uh, the way general general aviation was handled. I get why an auction's attractive. Why though, and you, you say this in your plan, and you've referenced it here in the interview, why can't we just make this fee simple property? Why can't we completely deregulate the air airspace? Why do we need any kind of regulatory oversight of this at all? And that's going to be a default position I think a lot of our listeners are going to be attracted to. And I should say this 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 was a tempting idea to me uh, initially, and I found in the course of doing my research, um, I don't think that would work well. And, and this you know, cuts cuts against some libertarian tendencies and, and free market tendencies. But I I, I came across um, and, and, and to shore up my my libertarian cred, I, I came across <laughs> a, a bunch a bunch of. Uh, Richard Epstein essays about mm-hmm. about um, and and he's he's a prominent 
a free market and libertarian law professor who who writes a lot about property, you know, dating back to to Roman uh, the history of property and all, all the way back to Roman times. And and the, there's this idea that you find, and it's a fairly ancient idea. There there is some property that is um, collectively held by the public, and and, and Epstein points out. Um, when there's congestion, it's it's not unheard of, and actually, it's pretty useful occasionally. I mean, you have to be careful not to take this too too far, of course. Sure. And there's more in my paper, but occasionally, um, when there is congestion, it makes sense to have a single owner, and 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 sometimes that single owner it makes sense. It's, it's the government. He 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 points out the example of in England in, in the 17th century, navigable rivers had via the common law acquired basically state ownership and management of the rivers because it, it was impossible. Uh, the holdout problem um, you know, is, is one factor and also the free riding problem is another. So with navigable rivers, you couldn't coordinate all the owners on the rivers to, to do things like dredge the river and make it uh, commercially viable for those up, upstream. So you, you have all these, particularly in transportation networks and, and, and transportation networks I, I think are special. Even, even Milton Friedman, uh, conceded in, in a paper uh, a few decades ago that downtown road networks are are always going to be controlled by by the government, just, and it's because of this holdout problem and free riding problem they're just intractable problems. It makes sense to to have a single um, public user. Now, there's all sorts of debates about you know once once you once we set that out, how, how do you do it? And and that's where my my paper contributes. But so. I, I think I, I don't think fee simple make makes much sense. And even, even in the, I trace this in the common law. There there was this this old doctrine that a homeowner owned property all the way up to the sky, down to the center of the earth. And even even common law courts started eroding that once once you had uh, airplanes, the, the beginning of airplanes and blimps and 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 other things and. Um, I, I don't want to go into the history too much, but it's it's in the paper. I, I think yeah. I hope it's persuasive to people. And and uh, and Richard Epstein has, has done tremendous work on, on this idea of of public trusteeship and when it makes sense for for a single owner, uh, a single government owner. Well, Brent, thanks for coming on. I I think uh, all three of us. Um, I mean, whether or not the exact particulars of of this plan makes sense, and like even as you said, there's there you know there's room for tweaking within how many layers and how large the units, the the, the cubes being auctioned, and exactly who's running the auction, how the you know, um, so there's a lot of room for um, uh, maneuver kind of within this plan, uh, but. It does. I'm I'm fairly convinced it's an upgrade over what's currently be, be being proposed, which is just a holdover from traditional aviation. Uh, I I can see the advantages of some kind of auction system, bringing the power of markets to you know to bear on on uh, the issue of what to do with this airspace. Um, and I should encourage our listeners, we'll have a link to Brent's uh, Mercatus white paper up on the show notes. So take a look at that uh, if you want to dig into some of the more the more nitty gritty details. If you are compelled by the example of 17th century riverine water rights in in Tudor, England. Is it still Tudor? Yeah, I think so. In Tudor, England, you can find the link in, in, in Brent's paper. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Brent, for coming on. And until next week, be well. Building Tomorrow is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy our show, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn about Building Tomorrow or to discover other great podcasts, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.